name is Robert T. Spew, or T. Spew. Um, and uh, I'm the attorney for the association, uh, for the Day Bridge Beauty Association. And uh, I've been asked to come here and talk a little bit about probably the most exciting <laughs> subject that we can talk about <laughs> on a Wednesday afternoon, which is budgeting and forecasting. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a disclaimer, of course, because I'm a lawyer. Um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a numbers guy. My dad was a CPA, and I fell really far from that tree, um, kind of lashed the family, going into law. And so um, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not going to tell you kind of how to, to calculate things necessarily. It's more, I'm talking a little bit more about the legal requirements, things to, to think about um, when you're on your board, think about what kind of things do we have to think about, what are some legal requirements, um, what are issues that, that we need to go through as we're looking at this. Um, so, first of all, why is a budget important? I mean, in some ways, this, this is kind of an obvious thing, but, you know, when I, when I think about my own personal <laughs> uh, uh, budget and things like that, you know, my, my, my wife and I were going to go on a vacation here this next week and kind of think about you know, what different things we're doing. Um, you know, her, her idea of, of what to do on the vacation is usually more expensive than mine. And, you know, I keep thinking, well, telling her, well, what's the budget? Is this within the budget? And I think when it comes to associations, that's kind of the same thought process you need to have. There's a lot of things that you could do as an association, a lot of things the board can do, but the real question is, what's the budget? You know, what can you spend, what can't you spend? Um, and, you know, frankly, what should you be doing with the budget? I think you know, the first important thing when it comes to a budget is that it's a little required. You gotta do it, it has to happen. Um, and if nothing else, what your, your budget is, you know, how well it's kept, you know, how well it's thought out, will also dictate the health of your association. Um, because in the end, when you think about what an association does for its owners, it really is managing some of these financial obligations that owners oftentimes want to be in associations so they don't have to think about. Um, of course, you know, some other thing, you know, with the budget, you got to think about what's going to happen in the future. You know, forecasting, looking at what kind of issues will come up someday. Know, and if nothing else, saving for a rainy day. Uh, and one of the things that's always important when it comes to a budget is assessments. Let's just be honest. You know, most people are thinking about you know going to a board meeting. Uh, most of the time, a lot of the owners won't show up to a board meeting unless you're talking about assessments. All of a sudden, people you've never seen before, neighbors you didn't know were your neighbors, they're showing up to the meeting that day. Um, and so, obviously, having a good budget will also dictate you know, what assessment rates are and how they should be set. Um, another thing that's important too is with an association, you're dealing with the common area. You know, how is it going to be taken care of? What kind of issues are going to come up? Um, how are we going to pay for it? And so those are all things that make you know, a budget very important. Now, I think what's important too, what I want to at least help you with is just making sure that you're equipped to do what you need to do. Um, obviously, you don't want to be talking with attorneys every single day to figure out what you're doing. Um, and again, you know, I'm not a numbers guy, so I don't want to talk necessarily about you know, what exactly should we put in the budget. But some things that you want to do is know where to look. So when it comes down to the first place you should always look at the association's own documents. The reason for that is that certainly there are statutory requirements, there's legal requirements, but ultimately the governing documents are designed to put together to try and cover that um, and to dictate what the association should do. Now, Another important thing, I'm, I, you know, on this PowerPoint, I mentioned there are statutes that are applicable um, when you're thinking about what kind of things to do for the budget, how to think about forecasting. But what's important about statutes, especially when it comes to associations, is that oftentimes, and it depends on the statute, oftentimes the statute will say, this is what you're supposed to do unless your governing documents say differently. And so, again, the idea is the place to start is the governing documents. Go there first. If you haven't looked at them recently, you should. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in those, especially you know, when it comes to budgets. I think most of the time you know, you'll be looking at different things, but the budget sections are the parts, you know, at least when I'm kind of reading through CCRs, those are the parts that gloss over because they're not important until they are, right? Um, now, again, when you're looking at governing documents, think about the CCRs, um, you're thinking about the bylaws, because oftentimes the bylaws may have more things in there than you think. Um, you know, the other day when I was putting together CCNRs and building documents for a different association. Uh, you know, it's, it's surprising what can be put into bylaws. And you'd be surprised. So make sure you look at those. And if nothing else, they're really good to look at so you know procedurally what you should be doing as a board 
Um, again, rules and regulations, depending on, I don't know, you know, for example, with the National Association, there's a lot of different resolutions, rules and regulations that uh, have been passed over the many years. And those matter with a sub-association, it's a little different, right? You, may, you probably don't have as many of those. Um, but over time, you may. And so make sure that you're looking at those and seeing how those are going to Because oftentimes, those are very specific. And oftentimes, we will be looking at things that are financial, uh, at least in my experience. And again, of course, there's the two main statutes that affect most associations. Uh, there's the Community Association Act and the section there, um, 57-8A. Now, if you're in a condominium association, um, that, that law that you talked about, the so ownership, uh, ownership Act, is one that was be specific to condominiums. Now, that being said, despite the fact there's two different ones, um, most of the time, especially when it comes to budgetary uh, items, these two statutes are going to be pretty much identical in most respects. Not always, but oftentimes they're the same. And so, um, what I would say is, you know, the default things that we we'll look at today will be the Community Association Act we'll look at. See, on the yes. associations, when you have a master community like Daybreak, where yeah. there are condominiums within it, does that mean that they're governed, the master association is governed by both, or? Not so much the master, right? The master is governed by the Community Association Act, but the condominium, the sub-association, will then be governed by the, the, the condominium act. So the sub-association takes responsibility for that, not making the master be responsible for it, even though the condominiums reside within the master? Well, what I say is, just, it's, it's more of a, and again, most of, the, most of the things in both these statutes are pretty similar. Well, it's oftentimes identical. Um, it's just that for a community association, what the legislature has decided to do, and for, frankly, like town homes and things, most of them are going to fall within that act. But because condominiums sometimes are different, there's more there's more regulation on certain things for those. And oftentimes, uh, when I say again, from a budgetary, budgetary standpoint, it won't change that. Condominium, the Condominium Act is going to be dealing with things that Condominiums share, you know, there's a lot more shared laws, right. there's a lot more ownership right. that the association has over a condominium than, say, you know, a usual community association. And so, what I say is, when you're thinking about it, it's more of a, a most associations are going to be in the Community Association Act, but when there's a specific condominium, that condominium act will govern what's going on there. Okay. This is a good question, and it's, it's, it's sometimes it's confusing, you know, even for attorneys, frankly. But, um, <laughs> So, what I want to do, just to give you kind of an idea, you know, especially since we're talking about the master, I want to talk about the charter. The reason why we can talk about the different CCNRs for all the sub associations, and and a lot of them are pretty similar. But what I say, one, because the charter uh, technically governs unless there's something specific in your your CCNRs, and it gives us, I think, a good idea of some things that you should be thinking about. Um, oh, and here's the food. This is Michael Goodrich, one uh, of my associates. He's, uh, he's great. So feel free to, to get up and get food. And I, again, I apologize for this all. But so with with this charter section, the, the, the section of the charter, the chapter charter that deals with budgets is chapter 12. And so here, this this excerpt from 12.2 um, is dealing with something I think is very important: is planning ahead when it comes to a budget. So you see here that it says at least 60 days before the beginning of each fiscal year. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding the fiscal year is usually in January, the association time, right? And so what we have here, if you think about it, you need to have essentially a budget put together one way or another before the beginning of November. I mean, that's the way to think about it. And so really, you should be thinking about what the budget should be, you know, working with your, your management company. I know different associations here have different management companies. But you should be thinking about, you know, probably around September, August, September, you know, what's the budget going to be? And there's, there's reasons for that, we'll get to it. But in the end, you as a board should prepare a budget, shall prepare a budget, and we'll get some statutory requirements just so that, you know, this is, this is kind of how it goes. But when you're looking at your governing documents, again, there might be differences in what your specific charter says. So look at that and make sure you're following it. And here's the reason why this matters. Um, because you, it's simple stuff like this that can mess around with an association. I, I've had an example where an association I represented didn't do this, right? And the first question that comes up is, you know, so they're already into the next year, and essentially what they did is they said, oh, 
we did the budget last year. We'll just, we didn't do one this year, but we'll just use the same one, right? And I mean, that makes sense, right? Um, you think, well, nothing's going to change. We'll just kind of keep going with what we're doing. The problem with this is that you'll have some owner in your association who's kind of thinking about something or doesn't want to pay assessments. It's trying to think of a way to get around that. And what they can do is they, they'll point to something like this and say, hey, this says you're supposed to do a budget you know, 60 days in advance. You didn't do it. Um, do I have to pay assessments? And then, you know, you call me, and then I say, Ooh, well, let me, let me, let's go work through this. <laughs> and it's not, it's not a fun scenario, right? You don't want to be there. So just, just keep that in mind. Little things like this matter. So make sure you're looking at issues like this. And oftentimes, a management company just kind of has this on their radar and they're kind of doing that for you. But, you know, depending on what you're doing, uh, they may not. And so make sure that, that you're helping follow those things. Now, here's another important idea when it comes to budgets, and this is why the 60 days matter that you're supposed to provide notice. And so in this case, in, in the, the Daybreak Charter, 12.2 again, it says at least 30 days prior to the due date of the assessments to be levied pursuant to a budget. So this is something that the budget needs to be sent out to the owners. And you know, for any association, this, this is very important. Because in the end, when you think about it, you, you were here because you're an owner, right? You're on the board, you're concerned about your association, you're concerned about your neighborhood. That's where you're doing what you're doing. Now, that being said, you represent those other owners that are in your association, and they want to know what's going on. And so, this part of the charter is giving them notice, saying, hey, you need to have this, this information, and what you need to give it to them. Because if you don't, again, it goes back to that idea that it says 30 days prior to the due date of assessments, can't you see someone coming up and saying, I'm not making assessments. You didn't give me the budget. I didn't know about it, right? And, and truthfully, by this type of notice, I think most people say, oh yeah, go ahead. Chief, what's the legal definition of the word send? Now, what's going to be important to that, and this goes with your governing documents, is sections to the notice. Okay? And so, for example, under the charter, what it would say is either by mail or if the person has um, provided their email address and allowed for an email to be sent to them by email. Right? And I know a lot of people within Daybreak do that. They have notice by email. Um, but that's where it comes from. So when it comes to sent, it actually has to be, do they have appropriate notice? And the first thing you go to that notice section of your CCNRs to see if that was the problem. So if that helps. Any other follow-up questions on that? No, I didn't give them. Okay. And so look at that. And oftentimes, I mean, the default is always going to be, despite the fact that I don't think it's always the best way to communicate with people at the nowadays, is mail. Mail for sure is a way. Um, but, you know, for example, I mean, I noticed with, you know, one of the things I, I do as well um, for association is collection. And, and just from my experience, sometimes people will respond to it pretty well, but I've noticed a lot of people respond to emails or even texts better than, uh, than just what you to see on it. But that's what that means. Anyway, so, so, and that's another thing to think about is are we doing this ahead of time sufficiently to give them sufficient notice that's required? Um, and so just keep that in mind. Um, and make sure that you're following notice issues. Now, I guess the, the, the next thing in my mind would come up is, let's say you do all these things. You put together a budget, you do it, you give an appropriate notice, you have that meeting where you need to talk about what the budget's gonna be for next year, talk about assessments, whether they stay the same or go up or go down, sometimes they go down. Um, what if you go through all that, you're this time of the year, and you're seeing it on the <laughs> There's something in the budget that we didn't think about or something changed, what do we do? Well, Keith? Yes. Where did we have last time? What's that? Two words I didn't hear you talk about right to disapprove. What does that mean? That's, so that's part of what the notice is about. Um, so when it comes to the, the right to disapprove, um, one of the reasons you're sending out notice is that the owners have the ability at least to attend the meeting where this is going to be accepted and potentially disapprove. Right now, that can sound like a worrisome thing for a board, but as I'll show you in one of the statutes that we look at, you really need to have, frankly, about 51% of the actual owners. And that's not just the owners that show up, but the total owners in the association disapprove the budget. So ultimately, 
the board has a lot of discretion to make sure the budget is approved. And the other thing to the laws, they're, they're designed so that you know someone's usually going to be upset with the budget, at least one person in the association might not like it. Yeah. Did I hear you right? You have to have 51 percent or more of the association to reject the budget that the board recommends. Yes, generally yes. Yeah, and so I mean, and that's that's a pretty high burden. I mean, I, I've noticed with associations, even for doing things that that most people want to have done, getting 51 percent is almost impossible sometimes, depending on how the scope of the association. But yes, yeah, and, and again, we'll, we'll, I'll show you some things that, that, that go down. Um, but again, what I'd also say too, with a lot of these things, look through your governing documents for that percentage um, to make sure you understand what that number is. Any other questions about this slide? So, where is going with, with, that, with those last comments is sometimes you have to revise a budget. Sometimes your budget isn't perfect, and you know, hey, we're not perfect people, and situations change. You may have something come up you just didn't expect, um, some type of maintenance or other issue that, that you just didn't see or you couldn't, couldn't have thought of, um, despite your best efforts. And so sometimes revisions of budgets need to happen. And what you should think about when it comes to revisions of budgets is that you kind of have to follow a similar process. Now, it's different than, say, like you have to do the 60 days you know, ahead of time and all that kind of stuff. But what you do need to do, is at least in this in this example, is provide that 30 days notice, you know, so they can see what you're changing the budget, and so they have that opportunity to reject it, you know, or at least try to get people enough people to do so. Um, so keep that in mind. I mean, you can essentially do some revisions, you can do a do-over, um, but just follow the notice requirements for doing so, so that everyone has a fair shake to make sure that they they can get their two cents. Now, I apologize for this being too small. <laughs> the language, um, statutory language usually is, so it, I, I'm comfortable with little tiny words. But, um, let me give you an example outside of the charter to give you this kind of general idea of requirements in the statute. And this comes from the Community Association Act again. And what it says here in this first part, at least annually, the board shall prepare and adopt a budget for the association. And so what I want you to think about when it comes to statutes and CCNRs, the statutes are four usually, right? They're a standard that, in one way or another, you can't go below, but you can, you can make it more strict. But here's the general rule is, you're going to do a budget every single year. You can't get out of it. You can't necessarily change that. And again, you know, if there's no charter or, or a CCNR saying something different, this is kind of what was going to apply. And so you look on here, the board shall present the adopted budget to associate, association members at a meeting of the members. So again, that's where you provided the notice they have the opportunity to appear at the meeting and show up and either say that it's a great idea or maybe talk about some things that they want to maybe include in the budget or they don't like the budget. And here you know, we talk about disapproval here. Um, you look at this next section, the budget is disapproved if within 45 days after the date of the meeting, under the subsection two, you know, the one about that we talked about, at which the board presents the adopted budget, there's a vote of disapproval by at least 51% of the allocated voting interest of a lot of owners in the association. So again, there's that 51%. That's kind of where that, that idea comes from, from the statute. Um, and then there's some other you know, different things they can do about special meetings and other things like that. Because obviously when you have, for example, you're revising the budget, if you know, you're, you're usually going to do the budget and explain that at the annual meeting of the association, it's the best time to do it. Um, usually most people show up to that. Um, but you know, if you're revising things, you have a special meeting outside the annual meeting, that's a good time to do it. And so keep these things in mind. Um, and, you know, just kind of an interesting side note, one thing that I think is important to know, you know, in dealing with, you know, when I deal with associations is when they're under that administrative control period, the founder control period, in this case, in Avery, um, you can't disapprove the budget that the developer control board uh, passes. So, just some interesting tidbits there. Um, now, things to consider. Um, let me, let me just kind of ask you, uh, what kind of things are you generally putting in your budgets? Because I think every association has some slight differences, of course, there's some areas, but you know, what kind of things are you generally concerned with when you're looking at a budget? Snow removal. Snow removal, okay. Building maintenance. Building maintenance. Great, what was the, what was the other one? Landscaping. Landscaping, big one, right? 
Um, and these are all kind of the basic things. Of course, you know, management fees, you know, you have to include all this kind of part of it. Um, one thing that, so here's this other section of 12.2, which talks about some things that need to be in there. And you notice it doesn't have like snow removal and landscaping on this. And I think the idea is those are things that are kind of the obvious things that are in budgets. This, this is more telling you some of the things that you may not be thinking about. Um, you know, in addition to any operating reserves, and I think operating reserves really referring to usual operating things that come up throughout the year, things that you're, you're usually thinking about when you're talking about budget. Um, but it also says that, and again, this is for the, the, the master, and each some association will have you know, a different language, but it's a similar idea. I also talk about including a reasonable contribution to the reserve fund for repair or replacement of any capital items to be maintained as a common expense. So that's, I think, another big thing that comes up with associations is what do the reserve? You know, what kind of things should we be thinking about as we're putting that in? And, and how should that be considered in the budget? Before you do that, yeah. <coughs> kind of closed over the operating reserve. Um, yes. What, what is the definition of operating reserve? You know, the, for example, in this case, the, the term operating reserve isn't necessarily defined uh, specifically in the, in the chart. Um, but operating reserves or operating expenses, that, and that's what we're referring to in this case. The things like we talked about when it comes to landscaping, the usual operating uh, items that come up on a more regular basis. Uh, the usual, I think maybe a way of putting it, is the usual bills that the association will have. Uh, any other questions involved on that? Or kind of, Wouldn't those be in the operating expenses? Yes. Yes. So in this case, what I think what's referring to is the operating reserve is more things that you're going to be using for your operating expenses and perhaps you know, putting things aside specifically for those. Because the reason why there's a difference is that um, when it comes to reserve amounts, um, or I should say for capital items, and I think that's why they're trying to split it out in this specific section, is that when you're doing the reserve for specific capital issues, you know, uh, updating, uh, you doing things, those are, those are things that are set aside differently, more long-term projects, whereas operating is more of a short-term uh, usual things that come up throughout the year. If that helps. Is there, now, maybe to follow up on that, are there any, any specific questions to that that you, that you might have? Well, or in your experience, maybe yeah, yeah, that's not what we together our budget this past year, for this year, yeah. we suggested that um, we, and we saw an opportunity to roll our HOA to because of some landscaping right. cost improvements. We suggested putting some of that savings into reserve, mm -hmm. and we were told it could not mm -hmm. by the CCMC. Okay. That's an interesting question. I'd have to look at that specific issue to, to say more about that, whether it could or couldn't, but um, that's, that's possible, right? Um, and it could be just based on your budget um, and how, how the budget is allocated for reserve versus operating expenses. But, um, and it could be just a specific situation or association. I don't know. But that's an interesting example. And I think, you know, what we probably do is maybe talk about that after. That specific issue we just kind of see what we do. Okay? Um, the reserve contribution. So, again, this is coming from that, that 12.2. Quite a long section. Uh, it talks about when it, specifically, you know, the number and nature of Replaceable so things that you want to think about when it comes to reserve and the nature of replaceable assets, expect, expected useful life of these. I, you know, I would use it for this as like a shelf life of things. You know, it, it doesn't matter what kind of thing there is. I mean, I look at the situation in my own home. You know, it was a home that was built in the 90s, and you know, I've been there for, for a bit. But, you know, since I've been there, some of the things that were original to the home had to be replaced. I had to replace the furnace, and the water heater, that was a fun experience. I know, replace window, was agreed on the roof. Um, and, you know, for a lot of those things, you know, for the water heater, it was, shoot, the thing, you know, didn't work anymore, I had to replace it immediately. But things like the roof, it was more, I, I knew that the, the shelf life again of the roof was about over. And before things became problematic, I wanted to make sure that I took care of it, right? And it's the same thing with an association. Each association has different common area responsibilities that they have to deal with. Um, and I, you know, frankly, even among all the various sub-associations, they all have different responsibilities. I don't think one 
this computer identifies from another. And so again, you, you want to look in the programming documents to make sure you kind of have an idea of that. And we'll talk a little more about the idea of inventory and those, those items. But part of this is one of, one of your responsibilities, and you can have help with this, is making sure that you understand kind of generally what that is. You know, I mean, how, how long the railing is supposed to last? Um, how long, you know, how long the roof supposed to last? You know, like my example. And then, of course, what's going along with that is the expected repair replacement costs, right? Because obviously, if there's something you have to do with that, it's going to cost something. And you're looking at how long is that, and what will it cost, or at least an idea of what it could cost, is something to look at. And then, of course, contribution required to fund the product projected needs by annual contributions or use for life of the asset. So the idea of the reserve is to make sure that you're putting things away, not necessarily for a rainy day, but for the day that you know it's going to come at some point. Uh, because you know you don't want to you don't want to, to have issues with your roof when the rain day comes. Um, so what do you need to know? You know how should you know? Again, the idea of forecasting eventual expenses, uh, inventory. Now and that's something to do, and I think a lot of times with with that, the management company has a good idea of what what that should be, um, and the different items that are specific to your association that are the area of responsibility for that association. I mean, like we talked about you know, before with the difference between condominium versus other, other associations, condominium oftentimes will have more responsibility than, say, you know, the, for example, the National Association when it comes to uh, specific buildings and things like that. Uh, and another thing that goes along with that is the idea of conducting a reserve analysis and support, you know, slash study. Oftentimes I'll call it study, but the statute calls it an analysis. Um, and so looking at that, specifically the statute, and this is something that's identical in both the uh, Economy and so Ownership Act and the uh, Community Association Act, um, except as otherwise provided in government documents. And, and again, that's kind of how it says, and I put that in there specifically because there are times, even something you know is important to say was written out, you, the government documents might change what the statute requires, okay? And so that's why the government documents is really the place to start. And so a board shall cause reserve analysis to be conducted no less frequently than every six years. Again, this is this is kind of the default unless you're uh, going about to say otherwise. Now, with that, that's something to think about is that this is something as a board you have responsibility to conduct reserve analysis, make sure that something happens along those lines. Uh, and and then what also is important to the statute, it says and review and if necessary of data previously conducted reserve analysis, no less frequently than every three years. So essentially, what the, the standard put in the statute, uh, and again, you know, looking at the government documents for what it says, the idea is you're going to do kind of a full-fledged one every six years, and then essentially you're going to update that kind of in between, right, in the middle. And the reason for that is just kind of like we talked about with your budget, sometimes you have to change the budget, you know, in the middle. Um, and sometimes things change. Uh, for example, uh, you know, when it comes to weather, you never know what might happen, right? You may have, you know, six years where you're planning, hey, it's Utah weather, it's going to be kind of hot and dry most of the time, and it'll be a little wet. You may have a year that is extremely wet, you know, more so than normal. I think that's kind of what we just had this winter. But it's, you know, it's a very wet, wet year, a wet winter. And, you know, it's going to be kind of cooler and different. And so how that affects, you know, the common area may, may be different. It may, frankly, prolong things and, and extend it out further. So you actually thought, hey, we have to replace something within the next nine years, but it's, it's really why. It's less, or maybe it's more. Um, so this is, what, this is why you kind of update things and make sure that you uh, have a good idea of what what issues may come up and what may change. Um, and you know, another idea that, that's important about this, and we'll get to this toward the end, is you, know, you as a board member, you, you have a lot of responsibility on, on you. Right, you're, there's a lot of things that you need to do, and just kind of, you know, even though I'm an attorney, it's not like I understand every little thing that should happen in reserve, right? And all the different things, or how long, you know, roof lasts necessarily. I rely on other people to do that, and you as a board need to do that, right? You need to rely on, on other folks. And so, for example, hiring someone who does reserve uh, analysis, reserve study, is, is very important. And you as a board, uh, whether you're under statute, under your government documents, have the right to reasonably, reasonably rely on those individuals, those professionals, um, so that all responsibility isn't necessarily just on your own intellectual uh, understanding of what's going on or your own, own uh, knowledge. 
Um, now, a reserve fund analysis, and this again, under statute, um, and, and you know, the CCNRs may change this. Um, this is a component, like we said, identify that you need to look at. Um, the statement of probable and meaning useful life. Again, just, what this is is to give you a kind of idea, you know, reserve studies haven't looked at. You know, they, they have, you know, here's this building, here's the roof. You know, we estimate it's going to last, you know, another 15 years. And because of that, we think that the potential cost of, of either redoing or replacing this roof is going to be, you know, an X amount at the end of that time. Okay, so it kind of gives you an idea of what, what those costs are. And so that helps you forecast what things you have to put in your budget. Because, you know, you may decide, hey, you know, we have so much that we want to do in reserve, but maybe because we have some things down the road that are going to be big issues, you know, here you know, in a while, we want to put a little bit more into reserve. And that's something to consider in that annual budget. Um, now, another thing, estimate cost repair, of course, um, and estimate total annual contribution to reserve funds. So this is something that, in that analysis, they give you at least an idea of what what this, uh, when you reserve, what you may put in that. Now, it's not something that you have to follow to the letter, right? But it is, it's, it's, it's an estimate, it's a guide, right? It gives you an idea. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's kind of more of a, of a safe place to be. Now, I, and at last, reserve funding plan directs how the association may fund the annual contribution. And so, again, it gives you an idea, you know, how much money should we actually put into this. One other thing that's important about this, and this is, you know, very similar to what we have with the budget itself, is that annually, and again, this is probably not really meeting, and this will help explain why the budget is what the budget is, um, you're, you have to do the summary of the most recent reserve, right? And, and again, you know, this is something you're doing every year. You know, you may have one that's you know, three years old, for example, that hasn't really changed since then, that you're relying on, and that's okay. Um, but the idea is, the, the owners have a right to at least know a summary of that, right? You don't have to give them the whole thing. But if they ask for a copy of the, uh, of the complete analysis, they have the right to do it. So this is one more reason that you know, people might look at the statute, some owner might look at this and say, hey, I want to see this. And you know, you want to be able to say, okay, yeah, we'll talk, we'll get to the right people and then and we'll provide it. Yeah. So if your management company has a website which every owner has access they can publish all these things like mm -hmm. governing documents and reserve studies all of that can be posted for view of all the homeowners right yeah potentially yeah and satisfy all these requirements mm -hmm. including the budget and yeah that yeah. would be probably the most efficient the ideal uh, way to help yeah yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting too. I think it just depends on, on what you and your association are going to do. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something you can do. Um, just to, you know, it's, it's one of those things where full disclosure is never a bad idea in an association. Um, usually, when you as a board are operating and people think that, you know, they don't know everything that's going on, and, and let's be honest, a lot of folks in an association, most of the time, they're just living. Right? They're just trying to do their everyday thing, and they're not thinking necessarily about what the budget or association is on a regular basis. Um, but if you, if you provide those things like that, that's, that, that, is, that is a way of doing it. Um, and I think a lot of these statutes, too, um, they were written, I mean, they update these things pretty regularly um, with the legislature, but um, sometimes they're still behind on the times, and a lot of these things are based on the idea that associations are still free internet and uh, you know they're basically mailing everything out to people. Yeah. Do you think that uh, financial information uh, having to do with a an association should be published uh, to the public, available to the public, or only the residents? But it, and that's a great question, and I think that's something to consider. Right? Because you don't actually, because your point is, is if you put something on a website that anyone can see, they, if anyone can look at it. Um, and you know what I've seen with, with some associations um, outside of Daybreak um, is that, you know, oftentimes they'll have a website which is specific to owners and they have that password and they can just get into it and see it. Um, and so, and I think that's appropriate. That's why I think the statute is the way it is, because it isn't saying you have to do that, right? Um, it's just that if an owner wants to see it, they can't, right? 
And so, yeah, you may find people, I don't want to miss it. And you as a board decide, hey, here's how we're going to provide it, and it's going to be in a way that it's just the owners. That's what the companies, they're the ones who have the right to see it. Um, most of them are not stuff, right? So, that's a great point. And this is why I think, you know, it's important to know kind of the general standards here, because you as a board can make decisions that best benefit your association or protect it, right? So, any other questions on that? And you guys are doing great. I, I, you know, I know this, this is this is pretty exciting stuff. Um, everybody loves to you know, listen to a lawyer talk about things on, on, uh, on their lunch break. Um, I, I want to get this last area and, and kind of we talked about this a little bit, but it's important that you as as a board are able to kind of think through what what's your what's your responsibility? What's the standard that you're judged against? And this is true of budgets, and it's true of just about everything else we do. Um, again, this is from specifically the day rate bylaws, and I'll show you a section of, uh, of Utah statute, which is basically identical. Um, so this is this is the standard. Directors and officers shall discharge their duties in a manner the director or, or officer believes in good faith to be the best interest of the corporation, and with the care that an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would exercise under similar circumstances. Isn't that great? Um, that language, I remember my first year of law school, this is one of the things they kind of threw at us. But the idea of, in, in, in law, quite often they talk about the standard is the reasonable, prudent person, right? And what that, what that means is, uh, a good way of putting it is that it's not necessarily what you think is reasonable as a person, you individually, right? It's an objective standard, it's a general standard, of what an ordinarily prudent person, so that doesn't mean an extraordinarily prudent person, right? Someone who's careful on every little thing. But it also isn't someone who's, you know, lackadaisical about stuff. It's someone who, when you think about prudence, it's someone who's making sure they're doing the things they're supposed to do. You know, they're, they're following up on their responsibilities. And so, one of the reasons this comes up is that you as a board member may think, look, I got stuff to do, right? I have other things to worry about. I have a life, you know, I, I don't have time. When you look at this, what the standards kind of say in a sense is, that's probably not a good enough reason. You have a responsibility that we've appointed you to do, and you should do it. If you don't do it, then the real question is, is where you being proved in the things you need to do? Uh, did you do it in a way that, and, and a good standard for thinking about this is, if, if someone came in to review what you did or didn't do, would there be a reason for you to work? <laughs> That's maybe more of a, a practical way of looking at this. Um, because if you've done things in such a way that someone can and say, oh, okay, it makes sense. You have minutes, you have records showing why you did what you did, and you, you show that you deliberated about something, you took the time to think through it, I mean, that's what a prudent person would do, right? And you take the best, you know, the best situation that you have. And again, what's also important is it's not a prudent person in an HOA in Florida, right? It's not a prudent person um, up in Park City. It's an ordinarily prudent person in a like position that would exercise under similar circumstances. And so the similar circumstances are important because, yeah, someone in Park City may have similar circumstances as you do here in Vegas. Um, but you're going to also be the judge based on kind of what's going on around what would a prudent person do in your circumstances or similar circumstances. So that's kind of a long way to go in but just keep that in mind. Um, now, another thing that's important that I try not to ever gloss over is the association's officers, directors, because you know, we're just talking about, like, you know, someone might you know, hold you to task, you know, what's the standard that you're held to, right? But an association's officers, directors, and committee members shall not be liable for any mistake of judgment, negligent or otherwise, except for their own individual willful misfeasance, malfeasance, miscontent, misconduct, or bad faith. This is important because, let's be honest, everyone makes mistakes. Even a board of reasonably prudent people trying to do the right thing could potentially make a mistake. And you're not necessarily personally responsible for that, okay? What you are responsible for personally as a board member is if you're doing something that is actively bad, 
right? Yeah, and I think a good example of this, an easy example of this, taking money from the association to benefit yourself. Not okay, you can't do it, right? Um, doing something, you know, you're hiring, hiring your, your, your best friend to do some maintenance on the association and, um, you know, they do a bad job, right? Something like that. Those, and, and this is why you reward other people. So if that comes up, maybe your cousin's a great person. You'll do a great job. But you pass that by the board so that someone can look back and say, hey, why did you have, why did your family member do this? And say, oh, it's because, you know, we looked at it. This was actually the best person to do it. They didn't want to get off. Um, you know, so things like that. And I think it's important that, yes? Uh, on the previous slide, the fiduciary responsibility is to the interest of the corporation next slide yes. the association. Right. And the reason why is, because um, again, one's coming from, from the, the bylaws and it's talking about, again, every single one of these associations is technically a corporation, right? And when you think about it, how how these, uh, the, the statute that, we'll look at that here in a second, the statute that governs what an association of words should do, um, unless the bylaws or something else is different, uh, is actually the Utah Nonprofit Corporation Act. And so, technically, well, you, the reason you have a board is just like any other corporation, right? They, they have a board, they have uh, officers, they have people that are directing what the corporation does, right? And so, technically, an association is a corporation, it's just a nonprofit that is run the same way, right? And it's just that instead of having shareholders for the corporation, you have owners that have an ownership interest. That makes sense. Now, again, this, this is uh, that, that statute that I just referenced. And again, this is kind of the general standard. If you look at it, what it's talking about is, you know, you shall discharge as a director or officer your duties of good faith, like an ordinarily prudent person in a like position with exercise of similar circumstances, and in a manner that the director or officer reasonably believes to be in the best interest of the nonprofit corporation. And so, again, that's what the standard is. That's what the statute, that's what it is in the government documents. Um, and you know, that is one standard I say that the government documents can't change. Um, so that kind of brings me to the close of this. Um, with, and again, this is just general ideas, uh, things to think about when you're doing a budget, things that are important, things that I would say are the future responsibilities for you as board members, that as you're working with, say, a management company, working with uh, the members of your association, that you think of these general concepts and, and that you have to be fulfilling those. And ultimately, the best advice I could ever give you is to know your government documents. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're like me, you just you know, fill up the government documents all the time, and uh, yeah, you might even like but I know that's not what most people do, but you as a board member, you should. You should know what's going on there, you should know what you know the deadlines, and if nothing else, at least know where to look when you have a question. Because if you do that, you'll always be able to to, to know. And again, you know, some of these, most of these government documents are online. So wherever you are, wherever you're on the phone, you can look it up and make sure that what you're doing makes sense. Um, and with that, um, any questions or thoughts or things that I can clarify? Is it okay? Let me give you a hypothetical. The Graphic Association is quite large, a self association, and it's got multiple property types. To what, what types? What's the difference? Well, uh, let's say some are detached. Uh, they're in a townhome <clears throat> type of regime, but they are detached buildings, okay? And the other part of it is detached. They may have some different issues architecturally and so on. Uh, could it slow the self-association if the work so determines? Uh, separate, it's reserved, it's a reserve A and reserve B. The one reserve contains one property type, and the other reserve two different property types. Mm -hmm. Especially, say, say they were built, they started the buildings several years apart. And they different styles. Yeah, yeah, different styles, different contractors. So you, the, the uh, useful life of the roofs different over here versus over here. Yeah. So, 
short of actually splitting the association, which I guess could be done if you engage an attorney and got it right, could they manage those reserves separately? You know, my, my general manager would probably know, right? Because there's one budget for the association. But I think what you could do as part of that budget is realizing that it's kind of like with reserve amount, you know, where you allocate different things for future projects. Uh, just realizing that, you know, each individual structure may have different requirements. Part of your budget would be, look, you know, building B, you know, we're going to allocate so much of the budget to that building. Um, or that's kind of that's kind of put the whole budget together because we know that building is going to have some specific you know, needs and the other building may not or have different ones, right? And so in the end, though, what I say is you generally have a responsibility to one big budget because regardless, you're going to have owners from both buildings who are going to want to see it, and it makes sense, you know, kind of like the reserve that you're, you're kind of thinking differently about those buildings because you need to, but you can do that within one budget. And, and generally, and I, I say generally having different budgets, kind of, uh, literally having different budgets, so one budget for one building, one budget for another. Um, I think from a, a technical standpoint, it'd be difficult to do, because most, most government documents are going to talk about the budget as opposed to multiple budgets. But I think you can work the budget to try and play with that in. Kind of, that, that's kind of my thought, if that helps. So, any other thoughts? Well, thanks for listening to me. I appreciate it. And, uh, and if there's any other things I can do to help, let me know. Thank you.